Hebrews, Hebrews, the ninth chapter. <clears throat> the book of Hebrews is written to give to us an understanding of a better way of worship, a better high priest. We have here in this whole book a superior high priest or a better high priest, a superior high sacrifice, and a better mode of worship. And in establishing that, the apostle speaks of many ways in which Christ is, has obtained for us a better salvation. And he writes to us in this ninth chapter, and I'll begin in verse, well, <clears throat> let me start in the verse 11. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that's to say, not of this building and not of this creation, is actually the Greek word there, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of pepper sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First, trans first Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon, neither the first testament was, dedica was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered, to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Here the apostle is setting forth to us the superior work of Christ as our, our Redeemer, Savior, as the Lamb of God, and as our great high priest. We are talking about the subject of the heirs of the Reformers. And we mentioned that there were seven errors that we wanted to deal with and the first one was the error of sola scripture, which is the subject that they make great emphasis upon, that they believe that the Bible is to be the sole authority in all doctrine and teaching. With that, we hardly agree. We believe that indeed, as Paul says, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. We believe that the Word of God is the sole authority and final authority in all questions pertaining to to doctrine and practice uh, of, in the worship of Jesus Christ. However, we noted that in their Westminster Confession of Faith, which is an expression of what they believe about 
the Scriptures, they make this statement, whereby that they nullify what they have said about the, about the, the soul of Scripture. In that confession of faith in chapter 1, under the subject of the Holy Scriptures, they make this statement in paragraph 6, that the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for His own glory, man's salvation, life, and faith, is either expressly set down in the Scriptures or by good and necessary consequences may be deduced from Scripture. And there they have simply nullified what we have said previously, that is, that the Word of God is the final authority in all that we, do- that we believe. And then you see, as you go on to looking at the doctrine of the, re- of the uh, Reformers, that they themselves built their doctrine upon things that were deduced from the Scriptures, and they talk much about logic and about human reasoning in the establishment of doctrine. Now, that is a great fallacy because our minds are indeed depraved, and we have not the right to make any deductions from the Scriptures when it comes to teaching the doctrines and practice that God's people are to live by. And so we said that that is a very serious error, and it is a very watershed between those who are following after New Testament teachings and those who are following after modern-day Reformed theology. Now, I make the statement, modern-day Reformed theology, because the modern-day Reformed theology is not the doctrines of uh, Augustine nor of John Calvin, but there has been a departure from that, as I noted to you last week, beginning in about 1500, in which they established what was referred to and what is it, what they call today the covenant of works, in which they said that there was a covenant made with Adam in which God entered into a covenant with Adam in the garden before he ever fell, whereby that God promised Adam that if he would do good and not sin, that he would could live forever. Well, that is, they say, deduced from the Scriptures. While the Bible makes no statement and no promises about that at all, indeed they readily admit that, but there is no statement. But in order to fabricate their doctrine, they have the works, out, works covenant, as they say, made with Adam in the garden. And then they go from that to say that Adam was a representative of, hum- of the human race. And they build their doctrine then upon rep- on federal headship. And as such, he is a representative of the human race, and Christ is a federal head of the elect. Now, indeed, he is a federal head in such, but he's more than a federal head. Adam is more than a federal head of the human race. All descendants of the human race were in the loins of Adam when he sinned. We were in, in Adam when he sinned. And that's the very statement that Paul makes in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, where he says that for by one man's sin, one man's transgression, death passed upon all, for in that all have sinned. When did we sin? We actually sinned in Adam. And so we were in the loins of Adam. In fact, the matter we noted last week, that that's... A, that principle of being in the loins of one gives responsibility or, or it gives uh, imputation. Paul, in the book of Hebrews, the seventh chapter, is talking about the superior priesthood of Christ. And he ta- shows how that Christ's priesthood is superior to the priesthood of Aaron. And he builds that principle on the fact that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, and Abraham, and that Aaron, Levi, was in the loins of Abraham when he paid tithes unto Melchizedek. Therefore, he said, by implications and by clear teachings, Abraham, or Isaac, and, Le- and Aaron were in the loins of Abraham, and he paid tithes unto him who was superior. And Melchizedek, who is superior to Aaron, blessed Abraham. So then Paul builds the doctrine of the superiority of the, of the uh, priesthood of Christ upon the fact that Aaron and Levi were in the loins of Abraham when he paid tithes unto Melchizedek. We were in the loins of Adam when he sinned. All this mankind, regardless of whatever race we may talk about, every one was in the loins of Adam we noted last week how that Adam refers to Eve and calls her Eve, the mother of the living. She is the mother of all living beings. 
And Adam is the father of all living beings. And so what Adam did, it is that we were in him as a natural head. So Christ is the natural head of us as God's elect people. And we notice some verses of Scripture whereby that we supported that. Now, what is the great issue? Well, you say, Brother Herb, you think you're making a great issue about this matter of federal headship and natural headship. What's, what's the issue? Well, I hope to help us to understand some more about that this morning. First of all, I will say to you that the doctrine of the federal headship is totally without any biblical pr- basis. There is no scripture at all to justify saying that Adam is merely a federal head. Federal head. Secondly, we noted that it is not only without any scriptural basis, but it impugns the justice of God. Why? Because God reckons with all human beings as having transgressed the law of God, as having been depraved, as having been sinners. On what basis? We all did sin in Adam. That's what Paul talks about in the fifth chapter of Romans again. You'll note there where he tells us that even though that we had not sinned after the same pattern of Adam's sin, yet death reigned over Adam, or over all descendants of Adam, even unto the law. Why did sin, why did death reign? Because sin, we were guilty, or all mankind was guilty sinners, having sinned in Adam. Therefore, all the descendants of Adam died up and even to the law. Paul says that where there is no law, sin is not imputed. Nonetheless, nevertheless, he says in verse 14, death reigned from Adam unto Moses, showing to us, that we all, or all the descendants of Adam, did sin in Adam. And so to say that God would make us to be sinners and that God would deal with us and cause us to die, charging us with Adam's sin if we were not in Adam, impugns the justice of God. But we were in Adam. You, we sinned in Adam. All mankind sinned in Adam. And as a result of that, all mankind is under the curse of sin. And all mankind is now lost and depraved as because that we did sin in Adam. Everyone born of human race is guilty of sin, having sinned in Adam. The only exception of that is Jesus Christ himself, who was not a descendant of Adam, but who was indeed the very holy Son of God. And by the marvelous miracle of the virgin birth, came into the world, indeed of the seed of David, but not of the seed of Adam, he was born without sin. And so this federal headship doctrine has no scriptural basis to it, and it is indeed impugns the justice of God. Now then, I want to talk to us more about this subject of the natural headship. Natural headship is of great importance to us as God's people, and I want to explain to you why. A few weeks ago, I was blessed, to, my wife and I, blessed to go with uh, Olivia uh, to hear Brother Matthew play in a symphonic orchestra in Tupelo. And I uh, was noticing some things as this orchestra was playing. Of course, a symphonic orchestra is an orchestra. The word symphonic means in harmony. And everybody was playing in harmony. And uh, I was noticing some, some things, especially as I was sitting at a view that I could see uh, the violins. And uh, I don't know exactly how many, many violinists there were in, in that orchestra, I, maybe 15, 20, something like that. And, uh, of course, the most outstanding one was Brother Matthew back there. And, uh, but uh, I was watching that. And it, it, every violinist, their hand would move at the very same time together, and they were complete harmony they were following after the music and they were in complete harmony they were playing in unison or they were playing the song the message music in unison there is an idea there is a thing a principle called a symphonic chord it corresponds to sound we have the expression the word that we use in talking to to people that we have sympathy with them by meaning that we are somewhat feeling with them their pains. Some 
fathers even, much to the delight of the mothers, some fathers, when the mother is going through childbirth, some men have sympathy pains. Father, wife is delivering a child. We have in this town two adult women who are identical twins. And I was talking to one of the ladies one day, and they're both believers, and so everything that she would say I would think would be truthful. And I was talking to her about this issue of twins uh, feeling things in common. And I asked her about, about this subject. And she said, oh, yes. She said, it's amazing how much we have in common with each other. Though we're both adults, though we're both married to different men, yet many things throughout childhood we have had same kinds of experiences. She said, fact of the matter is, she said, I had a appendix attack, and they rushed me to the hospital. My sister knew nothing about this, but she was at home, and they rushed me to the hospital. My sister was at home, laying on the couch. All of a sudden, she began to scream out in agony and pain because her she had sharp pains in her stomach. And she said, something's wrong with my sister. And so they began to make inquiry to find out. And sure enough, they found out that the sister was in the emergency room in the hospital with an emergency appendectomy. He said, well, how in the world does that happen? I don't know. Uh, scientists are hard-pressed to try to explain that. But here are two people who are identical twins, and, and they have many of the fittings of the same emotions. They, they are somewhat in sympathy with each other, more so than what people can really understand. So Christ, our elder brother, took upon him the human nature. He was born of the virgin. He was made to have flesh and blood. There is a vast difference between federal representation and natural, rep natural headship. It is not possible, Paul says in the 10th chapter of Romans, it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to redeem us. I'm reading from the 10th chapter of of Hebrews. <clears throat> Paul writing to us says, verse 4, It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. It is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. What about all the Old Testament sacrifices? Let me explain to you and point out to you that they were merely representatives. We were not in the loins of those animals. They were representatives for those whom they were dying for. On the Day of Atonement, there were two animals by which the high priest would bring, and on one of those animals he would lay his hands and he would confess the sins of the people. And in so doing, he was imputing and charging to that animal the sins of the nation. Well, you know that that's not really charging them, but he was doing so in symbolism. One animal then would be taken way out in the wilderness and let loose. Both of those animals signifying and pointing to the coming death of Jesus Christ. Now, those animals were representatives of individuals. Angels could have been a representative, but not Christ. He is not merely a representative. He is in every way made like unto us. For what reason? First of all, that he might be qualified to be our sin bearer. He alone has been qualified and is qualified to take away the sins of his people. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, ordained by God before the foundation of the world as the surety for our salvation. Paul tells us in this book of Hebrews that he was indeed our surety. The word surety is a word that we've mentioned to you before. It is a word that tells us about the work of Christ on behalf of His people. He indeed stood as our surety in the eternal covenant. He represented us in the everlasting covenant before the foundation of the world. And He made a promise to the Father that He would indeed be our sin bearer. And as such, He came to, far to redeem us and deliver us from our sins. Now, there in the Old Testament... There is a beautiful type of this 
first of all, in the, in the animal sacrifices. When God dealt with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, He told them and promised them the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, why did they not die immediately when they transgressed? Well, they did begin to die physically, and they did die spiritually. But God made a sacrifice for them. He took them, he took an animal and slew an animal, and by the shedding of that blood, he signified and showed forth that their sins was to be impugned, imputed and charged to the Lamb of God that would come forth and bear the sins of all of God's elect people. And he shed that blood and robed them in the skins of that animal showing to us what Christ would be for us, that He would give to us His own righteousness, and we would have the garments of salvation given to us because of Christ dying for our sins. On throughout the Old Testament, there were sacrifices, all of them pointing to the coming day when the Lamb of God would come. There was also a very significant character mentioned in the, book of, in the Old Testament, and he's called in the Hebrew the Goel, or, and we have it, the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer must be one who was of near kin. It could not be a stranger. It could not be someone from another family. It had to be someone of that fair persons of family who was of near kin. We made mention to you last week about the book of Ruth that talks about Boaz who was a near kinsman uh, for Naomi. And he, by his riches, Ruth was made to be rich. Christ is our kinsman redeemer. He is our near kinsman. And the reason he is qualified to be our near kinsman is because we were in the loins of Christ. His nature has been given to us. He became flesh and blood that he would identify with us. Paul talked about this in Hebrews, the second chapter. We mentioned this again last week, and, and I, I, I'm not apologizing for repeating myself because I want to have us, help us to have a clear understanding about the importance here. Christ is not merely a federal head, but understand that he became flesh and blood for the very express purpose that he would be identified with us as our sin bearer. And so Paul tells us that Christ was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that he, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is what Christ has done for us. He identified with us. In Hebrews, the second chapter I made reference to, that Paul makes this statement. Verse 14. Well, I start reading at verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. My brethren, Christ has a people. They are the children given to him by the Father. Back in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, we have our Lord praying that great high priestly prayer, and he makes reference to this. John 17, and let me read to you a, verse, a couple of verses of Scripture from this chapter. John 17, <clears throat> the Lord praying says, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. Now listen to verse 2. As thou hast given him authority, the word power, meaning authority, over all flesh, that he, Christ, should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. A people given to Christ before the foundation of the world. And so Christ speaking in verse 5 says, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept my word. You see, there was a people given unto Christ before the foundation of the world. He is our elder brother, he is our near kinsman, and he was made flesh and blood to show to us and to qualify as our sin bearer. And so in the second chapter of Hebrews, Paul says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church, I will sing praises unto thee. And again, verse 13, 
I will put my trust in him and said, Behold, I am the children which thou hast given me. Now then in 14, verse 14, Paul tells us how it was that Christ identified with us. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. I have spoken to you, and I have said this on different occasions, that the death of Christ was not an atonement. While many use the word in referring to the death of Christ, his death was real, was much more than a mere atonement. Atonement is an Old Testament word that speaks of covering, and it is a temporary covering. But the death of Christ was exclusively and the only means whereby God was satisfied concerning the sins of God's elect people. And so the word, the proper word about the death of Christ is, first of all, that his death was a propitiation. It was a satisfaction. And the reason why there's no more sacrifices to be ever made again is because Christ identified himself with his people and was made flesh and blood. And in Christ, we died for our sins. Oh, we didn't literally die personally, but in Christ we did. He took our sins upon him, and in his own body, he bore our sins. I believe Peter talks about this. In First Peter, <clears throat> Peter tells us about Christ Jesus, our sin bearer. And he tells us, First Peter chapter 2, he says, <clears throat> verse 24, Where, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. You'll note how Paul, Peter makes emphasis on the phrase, in his own body. When we observe the Lord's Supper, what is it the Lord wants us to remember? This is my body, which was broken for you. This is my blood, which was shed for you. He had a body that was broken he had a body that had blood, and in the shedding of his blood, there is a remission of our sins. It is a satisfaction made unto God. Isaiah 53 says, And God shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Nothing else ever satisfied God concerning the sins of God's elect people except the death of Christ. He became flesh and blood that in his own body he would take upon his, his body our sins and suffer and die for our sins on the cross. Not as a representative, but as our natural head, Christ Jesus. Paul speaks about this in the first Corinthians, the fifth chapter, fifteenth chapter. He says, in talking about the resurrection, and verse twenty. One, let me start verse 20. But now was Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead. Did we die in Adam? Yes. We became spiritually dead because of Adam's sin. We sinned in Adam. So all who are in Christ shall be made spiritually alive. Paul goes on to speak about this in later on in this 15th chapter. He says in verse 45, <clears throat> but I'll see, start at verse 44, about the body. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. And so it's written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. You see the parallel that Paul talks about in the resurrection and in the death? He says, just as Adam sinned and died, 
So all of us did die in Adam, sin in Adam, and we all, their natural body dies. There's only been one man that ever walked the face of the earth that did not die. Well, maybe the second man, prophet, Elijah. But the Bible says about Enoch, that Enoch was not, for God took him. He was translated into heaven. Elijah the prophet, similar in the same fashion. But otherwise, all human beings die. The point of the men wants to die. Why do we die? Because we were in the loins of Adam. Adam, our natural head. But all who are in Christ, chosen to be in Christ, but for the foundation of the world, all of them will indeed experience spiritual regeneration and a literal resurrection from the grave. Just as Jesus Christ came forth from the grave and is the first fruit of them that slept, so also we came forth, will come forth from the grave. Because you see, in the death of Christ, He did not merely, and I don't like to use, shouldn't use that word maybe, He did not only die for the sins of His people, but He also died to redeem our bodies from the curse. Your body, my body belongs unto Christ. He has redeemed us. That's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. What know you not that you're not your own? Your body has been brought with a price. Verse 20, the sixth chapter, 1 Corinthians. For you are been brought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our bodies belong unto Christ, who in his own body bore our sins on the cross of Calvary. And so his death was a propitiation. There is another aspect that we don't talk much about sometimes because they are so closely related to each other, and that is expiation. Expiation meaning taking upon himself our guilt. He not only took the punishment of our sins, but he took upon himself the guilt of our sins. It is that we now have been justified. We stand before God by the death of Christ as just as if though we had never sinned. How in the world could that be possible that guilty sinners can be made to stand before a holy and righteous God as though we had never sinned? Because in the death of Christ, there is the expiation of our guilt being charged unto Him. And thereby, we now are declared before God as being justified beings. Paul talks about this in the third chapter of Romans. Look at those verses if you're good with me, if you would please again. Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that were passed through the forbearance of God. He's talking about the elect saints in Old Testament days that God forbore, forbore, forbore with their sins because all their sins being charged to Christ. Now verse 26, To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just. God is doing something in a way whereby He is just and the justifier of him which believeth in Christ. He, God, brings about the salvation of his elect people in such a way that he is just in doing so, and he justifies his people. Christ literally was made to be our sin barrier on the cross of Calvary, and our sins were charged unto him, and the guilt of our sins placed upon Christ so that we are justified. Now, <clears throat> let me take you to the book of Hebrews again. In Hebrews, <clears throat> Paul talks about this, and he was, uses something here that we need to look at just for a minute. <clears throat> In Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 9. Let me start at verse 8. 
The Holy Ghost this, thus signifying that the way in the holies of all was not yet made manifest, while at the first, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. We talk about the Old Testament tabernacle. While it was standing, all those things, the Holy Ghost this signifying that the way in the holies of all was not yet made manifest. In verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did service perfect as pertaining to the, what's that word? Conscience. Conscience. Because of guilt. Now, <clears throat> go over with me, if you would, please, to verse, on down with me to verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What is it that the Satan, the devil, would like to use as to hinder God's people in following after Christ? We know that we are sinners. We can say, yes, my guilt of my sins and the punishment of my sin was laid upon Christ. But the peace of knowing that I have been justified by the finished work of Christ, Satan wants to deny us of that. Now remember, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore being justified, comma, by faith we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What is the great problem that God's people have a problem with concerning our sins? It is our conscience that reminds us that we were sinners, we have sinned. But here's what I want to show to you, friends. In Christ, we have the expiation, the delivering from the guilt of our sins so that with a clear conscience, with a pure conscience, with a sanctified conscience, we can come before the holy and righteous God to serve Him. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 2. <clears throat> Hebrews 10 and verse 2. <clears throat> Let me start at verse 1, Hebrews 1, 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which were offered year by year, continually make the converse down to perfect or complete. For, for then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshiper, worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. Yes, I am a sinner. Yes, we have all sinned. But here's what the Holy Spirit of God would want us to understand. That Christ died for the punishment and for the guilt of our sins. Therefore, that we might become for, before God to worship Him, to serve Him as justified beings. And there is no more consciousness charged to us of our transgressions. Again, look at verse 22 of the 10th chapter of Hebrews. Let me start at verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Note that emphasis on the words, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The washing of regeneration gives to us this benefit. There is a deliverance from an evil conscience. The Holy Spirit of God takes up His abode in the heart of every one of God's elect people, and the dead heart is taken out, and a living heart is put in, and it is a heart whereby that we are given assurance to draw nigh unto God because the guilt of our sins have been laid upon Christ in His own body. That we might have free access unto Christ. Not only is there the expiation in His headship, 
But there is another benefit that reminds us of the blessed benefit of Christ as our Savior, and that is high, our great high priest. Paul talks about this again in Hebrews chapter 4, who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, <clears throat> I gave you an illustration earlier about these true experience of these two twin sisters touched with the feelings of each other's pain. <laughs> it's beyond our understanding how this can possibly be, how the two human beings can have somewhat sympathy pains for each other in such a way that it is so demonstrated. But here's an important point for us to understand. And here's the critical issue about Christ being our natural head. Not only did it was he made to have a physical body without sin, that in his own body he could bear our sins on the cross of Calvary and make propitiation and expiation for our sins, whereby that we might be just before God. But he now is our great high priest who sits in sympathy with us. Who sits in sympathy. That's what Paul is talking about in the fourth chapter of Hebrews. Who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Here is the role of Christ on behalf of his people today. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Thereby, we are encouraged and told that we might come to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Did you ever go to a doctor and try to explain to a doctor about a pain that you're having and you just really could not get the words explained and tell him and you could tell the doctor was not really understanding, and so he will say, well, let's have it, let's give, let me give you an x-ray, or let's do some tests. Because he doesn't really know and cannot really grasp exactly what your problem pain is. It's frustrating at times. Did you ever go to a banker to make a loan? And you sat before this banker, and you're in dire need, and you wouldn't be there, and you're making a request for maybe a loan to buy a car or a loan to buy a house, some other emergency. And you're sitting there talking to this banker, and you know that all that he's looking at you is whether or not you have the collateral and resources to repay back the loan. And he has in no way has any sympathy for you. He cannot allow himself to function on that basis. It's merely a business transaction. If you have the collateral and your credit is good and the banker can justify making you the loan, he will make the loan to you. But it is not merely out of the goodness of his heart. Oh, he may be a nice person, or she may be a nice person, they may be kind to you, but that does not enter into the transaction at all. It's only your qualifications and your merit that brings about the transaction but not so with our, our Savior, our great high priest. You see, he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was made flesh and bone that we as his children might draw nigh unto him and cry unto him and bring to him our petitions, knowing he understands and is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And not only is he touched, but he promises to give to us the grace that's necessary for the very trial that we're going through. What a great Savior we have. What a great high priest we have. It's not merely that Christ is a representative of his people, but he has been identified with us, bonded with us. Some of you have children. Your children is flesh of your flesh and bone of your bone. 
Now, two individuals, a man and a wife, husband and wife come together, and there is then a child brought forth. That child is product of those two people. You cannot cut out either one of those people out of that child's biological body. Oh, we say sometimes, you know, but when a child is misbehaving in a bad way, well, it's the father's trait. And when they're acting in a good way, that's the mother's trait. Well, that may be. But you cannot biologically separate out the genes and the DNA from that child. It is composition of them. God speaks about that, I think, in the fifth chapter of Hebrews, the fifth chapter of Ephesians, where he's talking about the relationship of Christ and his church. And he uses here the relationship of husband and wife. Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Now listen to verse 30. For we are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. Do you understand what Paul is saying here, what the Holy Spirit of God is saying to us? There is a spiritual bond between the child of God and His Savior. We are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. Time and time again, the Word of God reminds us of the bond that binds us to Christ our Savior. In the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, our Lord speaking says this, verse 23, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Paul speaks about us being in Christ. He also speaks about Christ being in you in the Colossians, the hope of glory. You see, child of God, we are not left alone in this world. We are not individuals to struggle through this world and this life by our own abilities. Our Lord makes this clear in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John. Again, He said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. And he says to us, without me, you can do nothing. You see, there is a bonding, there is a connection, there is a union, the headship of Christ as our natural head, whereby that he imparts unto us his own divine nature in regeneration. And he imparts to us his seed, First John talks about that, that that which is born of Christ cannot sin. First John chapter 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, sin. For his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. The very nature, divine nature of God is imparted in regeneration whereby we are given the holy disposition to love God, to serve God, to fear God, and that we are imparted with a nature whereby it cannot sin. Our salvation is made complete and secure because of this union with Christ. Trivial to say that there's a difference between federal headship and natural headship? I think it's not. I think it's vitally important to understand I think it's a very serious era to talk about federal headship and relate that to Christ. He is not merely a federal head. He is our natural head. And His righteousness hath been imputed unto God's people. And He, as our Redeemer and Savior, took upon Himself flesh and blood that He might die a physical death to redeem us from the bondage and guilt of sin we ourselves were guilty of and thereby satisfying God in our behalf. And now He is ascended back to heaven, and He sits at the right hand of the Father, and He is there as our advocate, our great high priest, who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 
that he might be a faithful high priest, and that we might be encouraged to come to him boldly, that we might come to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and grace to help in the time of need. Why? Because he was in all points tempted like as we are. The humanity of Christ is set forth time and time again by his examples in the, old, in the Gospels. And all the reasons why these things are given to us is it qualifies him to, and shows that he is our natural head. Thereby we are encouraged to go to him to obtain grace, to help, and strength. And when he makes promises and says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he is speaking to us as his brethren, as our kinsman redeemer, whereby he made promise as our surety in the eternal covenant that we would be indeed conformed to his own image. What a wonderful Savior we have in Christ Jesus. Our Father, we come to you here this morning hour. We thank you for Christ who is indeed our natural head as our Redeemer and our great high priest, who has identified himself with his elect people, that indeed by thy divine grace and mercy we would be conformed to his own image. We pray that you would encourage us as your people today to know that our Lord has promised to never leave us nor to forsake us. May it be pleasing to you, Lord, to bring even those who have not yet by the Holy Spirit of God been brought to the knowledge of Christ as Savior they would today flee unto him who is the only satisfier for our sins. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.